Uh, today's panel uh, is the historical origins of unequal access to water. Um, we have with us uh, uh, three uh, faculty from Lums and Yale who were introduced yesterday, so I'll do a very brief, just a very brief introduction. We'll begin with uh, Dr. Anthony uh, Asiavetti, who, uh, as we saw yesterday, works at the intersection of architecture, landscape, and the history of science and technology. And uh, his current project um, is on uh, the Ganges and the Ganges water plane um, as a built, uh, a designed, engineered landscape. And I believe he'll be presenting uh, uh, on this today. Uh, and then we have Dr. Hassan Karar, um, who uh, uh, has a PhD in East Asian studies specializes in uh, China and Central Asia, and currently works on bazaars and markets uh, across, across the region, uh, as well as um, uh, issues relating to uh, borders and peripheries, governance, and development. Uh, and then Sunil Amrith uh, from, uh, from Yale, um, who uh, focuses on the movements uh, of people, and ecological processes that connect South and Southeast Asia. Um, and of course, he uh, has published many uh, uh, well-known books um, and is currently working on um, The Burning Earth, a new uh, environmental history on the modern world that foregrounds the experiences uh, of the global South. So we'll kick off with uh, Dr. Anthony Atsiovetti. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zaidi, and of course, uh, to all of LAMS. It's wonderful to be here with you all uh, today. Um, today, I'd like to talk about the virtues of seeing like a mudskipper, which is pictured here. These beautiful amphibious fish can live on land for days on end. What's more, they easily move between wet and dry, hard and soft conditions. Indeed, they are mud-loving creatures that have inspired my work for some time. And I'll speak about trying to see like a mud skipper uh, when it comes to understanding kind of the historical uh, you know, issues around unequal access to water. And they not only move between wet and dry with ease, but they have evolved so that when they are above water, they see clearly like we do as human beings. Whereas when we submerge ourselves, our vision becomes wavy due to how water refracts light, different than air, and mud skippers continue to see clearly. This kind of double vision can teach us a lot about how to not only reckon environmental uncertainty, but also incorporate it into our historical uh, uh, analysis of the built environment. And hopefully they can assist in seeing beyond dichotomies like hard and soft, water and land, wet and dry. And I spent the better part of a decade uh, seeing like a mudskipper to create a dynamic atlas of the world's most densely populated river basin, Gunga. And rather than try to shoehorn that work, which is ongoing into field work um, and archival research into this talk, uh, suffice it to say that what I'm going to share with you is the ways in which this basin became a giant water machine. And what I mean by that is if we look at the basin here, so you can see um, we have uh, Ganga here, Yamuna or Jamuna here, Bay of Bengal. This is all of the rain-fed agriculture that sits within the basin. And of course, this is all of the irrigated agriculture. And of course, over here we have the Indus, so we're just right over here. This is the most hyper-engineered landscape on the planet. There's no other river basin that looks like this kind of hydrological supersurface. So it's this incredibly engineered landscape, which of course is contiguous in so many ways with uh, the Indus. And it's less a mechanical device, like say the chronometer pictured here, which was used to establish and assist with longitude, but instead it's more like Luke Skywalker's bionic arm and the Empire Strikes Back. Is it a technology with a biology or is it a biology with a technology? So today I'll share with you some mud-loving moments that epitomize the virtues of seeing like a mud skipper and what that might augur uh, when it comes to looking at groundwater access. 
So seeing like a mudskipper means attending to this substance silt, which I shared with you yesterday, ever since the subcontinent collided with Asia 50 million years ago, trillions upon trillions of tons of silt have been shed from the ever-growing uh, ever Himalayas, between one and one and a half billion tons of silt. To give you some sense, Gunga barely makes the top 30 rivers in terms of length, but that's three times the sediment load of the Mississippi. And what I mean then is that, for example, this uh, these are a set of photographs I took almost uh, two decades ago in Varanasi in October, uh, over the course of two days. And Varanasi is over 600 kilometers from the sea. But you can, of course, see here that there's a kind of pulsing that's happening just over the course of two days. There's no rain. This is just all water being shed during the monsoons or just thereafter. And of course, it's not just been about an incredible, inordinate amount of water, but also the silt that you see building up on the Ghats as well. So a great deal of my work in trying to see like a mudskipper is to understand that choreography of silt, both chronologically, so kind of, you know, say 1890, 1900, but also cyclically. How does this change every year with the kind of capriciousness of the monsoons? And during that tempestuous firewater cocktail that we call the monsoons, this silt is what makes, of course, the basin rich for agriculture and its choreography, I would say, rewards scrutiny. And again, it's between 1 and 1.6 billion tons of silt that move across this larger landscape. And so I've not only tried to say, understand how does this silt move around, like if I'm looking from a satellite, but also because of my training in architecture and geography, I'm interested in understanding it sectionally, meaning if I cut a slice through the earth like a slice of cake, these are five slices of the earth that you see in these red lines uh, in the globe cutting through the subcontinent, you can see that uneven bowl that's formed between the Himalayas and uh, the kind of lower uh, Gangetic Plains. I not only then map out those, say, geometries of the, of the geography, but also rainfall patterns. Because, of course, rainfall is so correlated with the geometries and geographies of the, of the landscape as well. So this is a set of drawings that's not just looking at, say, rain from above, but cutting sections through it like an architect would to understand the relationship between space and rainfall patterns, both sectionally and in plan. And I'd like to take you to a city that I've been drawing for about 19 years now, um, the city of Allahabad, or what was recently renamed Prayagraj in India. You can see at the top, that's the Ganga. The lower uh, river here is the Jamuna. And I'll talk a little bit more about then, of course, the Triveni Sangam right here. It's located, the city, at the confluence of Ganga and Jamuna, and for some, a third river known as Saraswati. And this is one of the most sacred sites in Hinduism. Uh, and you can't see it so well here, but these are the brown gray waters of Ganga, and then these are the blue azure waters of the Jamuna. And oftentimes, these are spoken about two water bodies mixing with one another. But in fact, the reason that they have different colors is because of the sediment that's within them. So when we look at it, we might see two uh, bodies of water, but it's really two geological provinces that are mixing with one another that produces that. So all of the crumbs, uh, kind of tectonic crumbs from the Himalayas, are meeting at this confluence here. And so the drawings of the confluence and its environs combine cartography and photography to capture the cyclical rhythms of uh, the monsoons over a single year. Now, what do I mean? So this drawing here shows how surface water bodies, like riverbeds and lakes and ponds, expand and contract over the course of a single year due to the monsoons. Observing these slow motion changes are crucial to understanding the urban form and urban life of the city and its environs. The lighter tones of violet are when the surface water bodies swell with the monsoons, and the darkest tones are when they are at their shallowest and thinnest. And so through, throughout, throughout 2005 and 2006, I visited the confluence at least once every two weeks, where I snapped photos, like you see here, to create a panorama of the way the area goes from arid and dry to wet and gelatinous silt. These panoramas, as I'll show, complement the slow motion changes I was documenting cartographically. They demonstrate a different on-the-ground perspective of how people make use of the temporality of soils and water. So this is a panorama taken during uh, Magmela, an annual religious festival 
that takes place at the confluence every January and February, where a temporary city is constructed on the banks and sandbars of the two rivers. It's full of tents, uh, has electricity and running water. Between two million and, four mil and three million people pass through the tent city over the course of 45 days. Once the festival ends, the outline of the gridded city remains on the ground <coughs> and farmers move in and sow and harvest crops. In other words, the banks and sandbars are transformed from hyper-dense and urban to agrarian in less than two weeks' time. Farmers harvest their crops, the monsoons arrive, eroding the sandbars and shores, and completely washes away the ground. This process of urban to agrarian repeats every year. This combination of cartography and photography captures these slow motion changes and the ways in which people build on the deep rhythms of the monsoons. <coughs> and the drawing has been published elsewhere, mostly depict a different way of drawing the layers of city, ranging from temporality and biophysical changes to social and sacred transformations. And of course, this is the site of the Kung, or full picture, where typically which typically happens every 12 to 13 years, spoken about as the largest gathering of humanity on the planet, between 80 and 100 million people pass through this area over the course of 45 days, which is an incredibly large city of hospitals, fairgrounds, pontoon bridges, bundles, etc. But what I think is more spectacular to me is that this space grows from this tent city of millions of people to this agrarian space in just two weeks. All of the silt and sediment that has collected here over 50 million years ago acts like a sponge, which is which with one able to strike groundwater in less than 20 meters, oh, sorry, 20 centimeters to irrigate crops. And as you can see here, the footprints of the tents and avenues remain tattooed on the sandbars. It's a drawing at the scale of the territory. Now, this is the most intelligent use of space I've ever witnessed. And, the, and drawing these processes provides a blueprint for how to build on these deep rhythms of the monsoons, a process that more and more parts of the world would benefit from with climate change and greater environmental uncertainty. And it's important that I contextualize for you this work, um, which I began seeing like a mudskipper all the way back in 2004. The best books that I could really find on the Gunga Basin were, say, Raghubir Singh's Ganges, or an avalanche of numbers, histories of cartography, madcap travelogues. Google Earth had just gone live. Drones existed, but were mostly being used by the Bush administration for surveillance and assassinations. Grace was active, but its resolution is so low that it was incredibly useless for this kind of work. So all I really had to do with, uh, to map this area out at my disposal was a Garmin E-Trex GPS unit that you see on the left, and a really clunky Nikon Coolpix camera to do the work of examining this watershed. And when I arrived in India in 2005, I hoped to find contemporary maps, but these were the best that I could find, mostly from the 60s and 70s that were oftentimes just tracings of maps previously drawn in the 1950s. So in short, the basin had not been comprehensively mapped in over half a century. So I had to go out and walk the land, and I show you this not because of how bad I look with long hair uh, and split ends and a uh, you know, Texas Longhorns hat, I'm not from Texas, uh, but because I became my own barefoot uh, cartographer, historian, and architect. And here I'm standing in a brewing dust storm of silt and sediment whipped up in March. And so, which is important, I believe, because I came to study the river basin and larger watershed in terms of its being water, mud, dirt, dirt dust, for some people, deity, and so much more. And so it goes all the way from Gangotri Glacier, up in the Himalayas, through the Indo-Gangetic Plains, snapping over 25,000 photographs to create a near panorama of the basin, which is why this work took a decade as opposed to one year to complete. And seeing like a mudskipper led me to making my own prosthetics and instruments to visualize the dynamism of the basin. So because it hadn't been mapped in over half a century, I had developed my own guerrilla tactics to measure these changes through devices like the surface accumulation sleeve that you see here, a prosthetic that one wears over their right arm 
to map soils. It's equipped with a GPS unit as well as rolls of packaging tape so that just as, say, Spider-Man shoots his web from his wrist, I shoot packaging tape from my arm to collect soils. The imprint left in the soil shown here is from me shooting one kilometer of packaging tape perpendicular to the river channel to collect soils. And here you can see the instrument exhibited in the Seoul Architecture Biennial in 2019 and a kind of close-up of, of a diorama of using um, this technology. And here another kind of close-up of an iteration which isn't so comfortable in 45 degrees Celsius weather. And yet here another kind of iteration that was definitely more comfortable. Probably some of you remember those Nokia mobile phones. And here with the kind of extended version. And because um, this was also quite uncomfortable to do and hurt my back, I also repurposed a remote control uh, car with these devices to make my own rover, as you can see here, tricked out with packaging tape, torch, camera, and more. And here as well in profile and just above too. And because these rolls of tape get extremely large and accumulate a lot of stuff, as you might imagine, I devised what I call a Gunga dip sock, where I bought 100 pairs of pristine white cotton tube socks, uh, thrust them into the soil uh, in the water channel to collect soils, and then dry them out and geotag them. So that when I went through customs and was asked why I had so many soiled socks, I'd just say that I didn't have time to wash my laundry, uh, and I ended up getting all of these socks uh, through. But if I go back to the tape for a second, along with it being like Spider-Man's web, uh, as a dear friend of mine who teaches at the University of Tokyo told me, it's uh, very similar, the packaging tape acts like the orb uh, in Takahashi's 2004 game, Katamari Damasi, where small objects like spoons and paper clips adhere to this orb, and as more objects stick to the orb, it grows with jungle gyms and cars, snowballing to the point that it collects stadiums and entire city blocks. My strands of tape collect soils, but also flowers, fecal matter, plastic, auto parts, and so much more. These artifacts from human and non-human occupation allow me to conduct an ethnography of the soil. Using the wrong thing for the right purpose defines so much of the work that I've done in studying soils, water, and urban form. And like a mud skipper, these devices allow a user to move back and forth between field work and lab work like a sinusoidal wave. <clears throat> and after scanning many kilometers of tape, I didn't have any instruments to analyze the soils. So I turned to that trusted Photoshop tool called the Magic Wand which might be used like this when one wants to digitally place a tattoo on someone's chest. But I misuse the magic wand to break down particle sizes. Using the wrong thing for the right purpose allows me to make my own remote sensing devices when no data is available. And so I use these techniques of using the wrong thing, again, for the right purpose, to make drawings of Allahabad, but also transects like these across the basin to visualize its dynamism. So I like to think of these drawings in terms of fashion. If most cartographic drawings are like couture, like say Christian Dior, where the measurements are customized, my drawings are more like ready to wear from H&M and Uniqlo as they have what's called a seam allowance so that if you gain a few kilos or lose a few kilos, they still fit. I'm then able to go into even more depth with the transect like you see here to not only look at how surface water bodies expand and contract, uh, but this is also very much tied to looking at the ways in which the hyporheic zone of, say, groundwater and surface water intersect with one another. And groundwater extraction technologies, which I guess you can't see so well uh, right now at this resolution. But it allows me to even then start to go at the level of cropping patterns to the, during the two principal uh, seasons. And it's this building up of silt over millions of years that makes this not only one of the most productive alluvial basins on the planet, but also one of the highest levels of groundwater potential, um, which is to say that the Gunga Basin is like this giant sponge that has been a laboratory for groundwater extraction technologies. 
And throughout this process, I would constantly stumble onto advertisements from, say, Compton Greaves, like you see here, where the tube well is drawn always in section, and the farmer is extolling the virtues of the tube well in terms of water and more crops. And this resonated with what I began to draw, where one can see how the patterns of urbanization uh, along different forms of water infrastructure going from left to right. And as we move uh, from rivers on the left side to tube wells on the right side, you can see how the settlement pattern grows more diffuse and spread out. This is because the tube well and pump technologies allowed for such diffuse expansion to occur. And while I have an abridged time wall in an exhibition that I have up at Yale, uh, suffice it to say I don't have time to try to recount the history of how this developed, certainly as a kind of 19th century technology that then certainly starts to go global in the 1860s before arriving in the subcontinent and how it becomes such an instrumental technology um, for the Raj and others. But what I would rather say is that also seeing like a mudskipper and when it comes to groundwater means also starting to look at a much deeper and thicker Earth's crust. So I try to look like a geologist might when they create these geological graphical logs to understand the stratigraphy. So for example, a kind of log might be where we see up above uh, kind of housing and then those black lines piercing through are tube wells and then we see the strata here. Well, what I do is I, of course, draw the strata, but I flip it 180 degrees and then I put a mirror underneath it so that I can exhibit the strata hanging from the ceiling with the mirror below so that I can start to see the urban form in relationship to the strata. And the reason for that is better understanding the way that the subsurface becomes a protagonist in shaping urbanization across the Earth's crust. And I look at that at the scale of the house. Certainly, for example, this house that was built in 1954 that I mentioned yesterday that I won't go into great detail, that has at its center, unlike so many of these other houses uh, that were exhibited with it in 1954, this house has a tube well at the center of it, uh, as you can see here. And this becomes effectively the de facto form of accessing groundwater for so much of urban, not only India and South Asia, but so many other larger parts of the world across North America, Southeast Asia, Africa, Europe, Australia. And I try to understand in that intimate scale of groundwater access in relationship to domestic space through a series of spaces, again, hanging these from the ceiling to better understand the depths that one has to go to to harness this groundwater technology. And then again, the neighborhood scale as well. Looking at, say, Lonely, which just is outside New Delhi, and this is, I think, where I'll end, of the ways in which you can see this hyper-dense urban environment that was designed as part of the uh, Delhi Master Plan of 1961. This area was supposed to be supported by uh, several hundred tube wells, yet today it has over 15,000 privately owned hand pumps. And so you can see in the image above the density, and then of course the hand pumps that are both public and private. What's notable here is that when you have such intense amounts of urban growth, it creates an incredible amount of impermeable surfaces, so the aquifer cannot be recharged. So this area naturally has an incredibly robust aquifer, but because of human population growth and this relatively un, uh, unregulated uh, economy of groundwater access, we start to see an incredible issue surrounding urban growth in relationship to the soils of the 21st century in terms of groundwater extraction. So what I'd like to leave you with with this image is not so much necessarily the, um, the history of how this got to be the way that it is, but that there's an incredibly both deep history that's operating here in terms of the soils and creates hyper differences in terms of who has access to this uh, groundwater. So while it's evenly uh, distributed, it's unevenly accessed. And I think that's an important part to understand in terms of cities and the way that they're growing and access to groundwater. So thank you. Uh, we turn now to uh, Dr. Hassan Karar, who will be presenting uh, the parched Indus Delta, precarity and injustice, a century in the making. Why 
morning, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, so delighted to be uh, presenting some thoughts on uh, the desertification of the data um, This image that you are seeing, uh, this was taken in uh, Karangi, in Karachi, more specifically uh, in Rahim Hadri. Okay, so uh, moving on to the next slide. Now, uh, this gives us, uh, if you look at the map on the left, this actually depicts uh, the region that I'm talking about. So you can see the Indus coming down, straight down the map. Uh, and then uh, to the right of that would be the Indus Delta area. Now, just one or two quick points. Uh, one is that the Delta starts fanning out uh, about 200 kilometers before it reaches uh, the Indian Ocean, the Arabian Sea. Uh, the sort of city of Karachi marks the northern extremity of the delta, and then it sort of kind of fans out towards the run of Kutch, and you can make that out uh, on the map on the left. Uh, there's three districts currently within the delta, that's Badim, Tatta, and Sajawal. It is a multi-ethnic and a multilingual region. Uh, so by multilingual, uh, what I mean to say is that besides Urdu and Sindhi, uh, one here is Balochi being spoken, Gujarati being spoken as well, and that speaks to the historical connectivity between the Delta and other ports in the Western Indian Ocean. Um, the way in which the traditional ecology would have looked like, and I'm saying traditional ecology because that is not the reality right now, uh, sort of in the northern reaches of the delta, you would have had forests giving way to mud flats. The mud flats were flood irrigated. And then finally, in the lower stretches of the delta, uh, one would have found mangrove forests. And if there's one salient point that needs to be emphasized over here is that most of the time, there is no water in the lower stretches of the Indus Delta. So it's parched, it's completely dry. Now, uh, depending on how much I can get through in this talk, um, I'll, I'll sort of begin sort of with this discussion about neoliberal futures, the sort of so-called Shenzhen that's uh, going to be constructed here. Uh, I'll move on to the present, then I'll sort of go into the past. And then what I'll try and do, and this is of course assuming that I can get through all of this, is uh, see if we can link this up to other uh, examples uh, within Pakistan and perhaps sort of tie it up with some of the themes uh, of this uh, of this conference uh, justice uh, precarity uh, resilience and so on and so forth okay oh well that's mine and this, uh, this is <laughs> this is not this is not terribly deep I won't spend too much time on this this is a screenshot from the uh, Zulfikarabad Development uh, Authority, uh, sort of, you know, got the standard nationalist stuff, and uh, sort of given the fact that it references Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, the former uh, Prime Minister of Pakistan, there is unsurprisingly an image of Bhutto as well on the left. But uh, what is especially striking about this image is the way in which they've graphically depicted what will happen to Katie Bandar, the Indus Delta region. Uh, in the top right image. And the most striking thing about this is the fact that there is actually water there, uh, whereas the reality looks something like this. This is uh, where Zulfikar Abad uh, is uh, meant to be built. Uh, this image was taken in January 2020. Uh, I had gone down to uh, Keti Bandar, and at one point, uh, the person that I was with, he said, okay, stop the car. And, and then we stopped and he said, this is, this is Zulfikarabad, this is it. And if you look very closely, uh, and you can't see very well because it was dusk, but there's, there's, a, there's a, a, a mud hut, a shack, uh, but it's all dry. It's all, it's all, it's all uh, uh, sort of completely parched. Uh, there's about 300,000 people who still live in the Indus Delta region. About 100,000 of them live in Tatta. Uh, which is a small city, then there's some uh, uh, sort of, I suppose, peri-urban communities and other smaller cities. And then these are what the local people would describe as villages. Uh, and there's scores of these so-called villages. They're not really villages, but they're just extended families of two to three generations living out in these uh, deserted regions. 
Uh, they usually have some livestock. They collect deadfall. And as you can see, um, uh, sort of on the right-hand side of the image, they sometimes grow small quantities of crops. But the, the uh, sort of the impediment to that is that there is very, very little water. Uh, you see stagnant pools of water. So humans drink first, then animals, and what's left over uh, usually goes to um, eking out uh, sort of very, very small uh, subsistence uh, farming. What was also interesting about stopping at this point is that the person pointed out that, well, this is a Fakarapan, and then he says, we will not let them build it. Uh, and I looked very surprised, and his point was a good one. And he said that there's 300,000 people who live out in this wilderness. If you build Zulfakarabad over here, where do you intend to go and throw these people? This is uh, sort of on the way to Zulfakarabad. Uh, this was a long march that was taking place. And you know, we stopped and we joined it. We took a few photographs. And the demand of this long march was to build a metal road out to Zulfikarabad because the sort of last two hours or so are on this unbroken road. Now, <clears throat> I, I sort of chose this image to show over here because the people were demanding something as basic as a road which would take them to Keti Bandar and then beyond Keti Bandar, Shah Bandar as well. And this is juxtaposed against these fantastical uh, imaginaries about how through port cities you're going to magically transform uh, the fate of this region. And uh, speaking to the people in uh, the interior of the Indus Delta and then sort of in these ongoing conversations that I have with uh, people in the Pakistan Fisher Folk Forum uh, who are based on Korangi, uh, they, don't, they don't necessarily aspire to a new Shanjan uh, in the Indus Delta. Their demands are much more simple. They want a road, uh, they want uh, potable water, and they're very, very clear about why exactly it is that the delta has become uh, deserted, why it is that there's a shortage of water uh, in, this, in this region. Um, moving on, uh, this is uh, sort of what the scene looks like uh, as one gets closer to the coastline. So just beyond these, just beyond these huts that you can see. Uh, in the middle of the image uh, would be, would be the, the actual coastline. And what's important in this image is not the huts in the background, but the fact that right in the front is extreme salination. So the white that you're seeing, uh, this is all salt. And the uh, significance of this is that uh, this, is, this is recent. This is as a result of the encroachment of the sea. Uh, into the coastline, Muhammad Ali Shah, the late Muhammad Ali Shah, who was the first chairperson of the Pakistan Fisher Folk Forum, uh, he used to sort of say that, well, the Keti Bandar that you see today is actually the third Keti Bandar. There was one Keti Bandar, it was eaten up by the sea. There was another Keti Bandar, that was eaten up by the sea. And then the city keeps getting uh, sort of uh, pushed further and further inland. The reason for that, of course, is the fact that there is less and less water which is uh, flowing down the Indus. I'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, but this is a result of decrease in water flows over the last uh, 100 years or so. And as Muhammad Ali Shah also used to say, uh, there was a time when people from the Indus Delta would say that we are from the place where the river flows into the sea. Uh, but now we say that we are from a place where the sea flows into the river. So it flows into the, into the interior. And the result of this has been a steady out-migration uh, from the Indus Delta area. The other thing that uh, I am struck by uh, speaking with people, and I acknowledge the fact that here, you know, we're, we're sort of also having to account for the role of memory, the way in which people think about a past, glorifying that. But the other thing that I'm struck by is the fact that uh, people of the Delta uh, sort of are quite insistent that fishing is a relatively new vocation. Uh, their point is that previously this was an area that was primarily uh, agricultural. Uh, the economy was primarily agriculture. Uh, and once again, you know, sort of, you know, this is Muhammad Ali Shah telling stories while he was still alive, but he said that you know, a substantial portion of the wood that was burned in Indian locomotives used to come from the forests uh, of, the, of the Indus Delta. Uh, other people recall that as late as the 1970s and the 1980s, mangoes were still grown uh, in the Delta area, watermelons were grown, rice was grown. Someone who's from Sajawal, who's a development professional in Karachi, 
said that it was unthinkable that we would actually go to the market to buy rice. But uh, now, of course, sort of one has to do that. Um, so this is, um, so this is this is an image of crabs being sorted out uh, after they were after they were caught. Uh, the, the sort of primary vocation, at least along the coast, uh, is uh, fishing. Uh, this is a highly uh, uh, credit-driven uh, fishing industry. Uh, then, besides that, as I mentioned, uh, there is there is scavenging uh, in the commons, um, and just sort of. To reinforce the point that I was making earlier, uh, some of the accounts that I've looked at, and I haven't sort of researched this very extensively, but you know, this is from the transaction of Bombay geographers in 1840, they affirm the fact uh, that uh, sort of until the 19th century or the middle of the 19th century, uh, what we do end up observing is that there was extensive uh, agricultural activity in the Indus Delta area. Pakar, how much? Uh, uh, seven minutes. Seven minutes? Okay. I'll, I'll slowly start moving this forward. Okay. Um, now, the, the sort of story of the Delta and the story of decreasing water supply in the Delta links up with uh, the larger story that uh, Professor Imran Ali referenced uh, at the beginning of his talk uh, yesterday, namely the fact that uh, there's the construction of canals. Uh, in the Punjab at the end of the 19th century. Uh, then there's uh, uh, sort of barrages which are being built in Sindh uh, in the middle of the 20th century as well. Uh, and all of this leads to decreasing flows in the Indus Delta. But I don't want to give the impression that this is simply a Punjab versus Sindh story, because it's not. Uh, the last area where the water is siphoned out is just above the delta region. So the point is that being downstream means being downstream, whether sort of, you know, one is talking about Punjab versus Sindh or the actual delta area versus upriver districts uh, in Sindh. Uh, and one of the things that people pointed out was that, sure, I mean, you know, sort of there's the provincial politics, but there's also uh, a regional dimension uh, to this as well. Um, just sort of, you know, by way of, by way of thinking about uh, uh, sort of how this might link up with, 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 with other uh, examples in Pakistan. And the reason I do this is because besides my very broad, admittedly superficial interest in coastal development, uh, I'm interested in how we think about disasters, I'm interested in how we think about precarity, I'm interested in the role of the environment and changes in environmental form insofar as it tells us something about uneven development, governance, securitization, and so on and so forth. Uh, and this is an image uh, from North Pakistan, from the Karakoram, a part of the country that I'm slightly more comfortable talking about. Uh, and more specifically, this is the Atabad Reservoir, properly known as the Atabad Lake, even though I sort of still struggle to call it uh, a lake, because it comes about as uh, it, this water reservoir, water body, is formed as a result of a rock slide in January 2010. And the reason I bring this up is because similar to the Indus Delta area, uh, where people are deeply cognizant of why this so-called disaster is happening, the same was the case over here as well. Uh, so with the formation of the Atabad Reservoir, uh, People had long been cognizant of the fact that the mountain slopes were unstable. Uh, going back to the 1990s, there are uh, new stories about the fact that the slopes around Atabad village uh, were unstable. So this just reinforces this notion that, or at least to me it does, that sort of there's nothing unexpected about natural disasters. These are reflective of fissures and fractures. Uh, in, in, in political economy. And for me, Atabad is uh, sort of a, a really interesting example of that. And I think the story of Atabad gets uh, yet more complicated because it allows us to... Okay. So it allows us to, to sort of think about how we approach natural disasters, how we approach climate change, uh, change in environment, uh, and the way in which we deploy political lexicons. And on the left, I've got uh, sort of uh, an image, and some of you have seen me use this image before. 
that's that's uh, Babajan, and the short version of, of of sort of who Babajan is that he's a Gilgit Baltistan-based activist uh, who spent about eight years in prison. Uh, he was tried under the anti-terrorism laws uh, because he had been protesting for compensation for villagers whose um, abode had been destroyed in the Atabad landslide. Oftentimes, he is described as Pakistan's first climate activist prisoner. I'm not so sure that this was a case of climate change. Uh, the Atabad Reservoir came about as a result of landslides. Uh, these landslides have been having, happening in the Karakoram for thousands of years. Um, so the reason I mention this is because it allows us to start thinking about how people talk about climate change and what people might be talking about when they talk about climate change. I can sort of get into this a little bit later. And then on the, on the right is what happens to Atabad now. Uh, and this is a type of place I'm making. So Atabad now has become a place of leisure. As I said, it becomes an Atabad uh, lake. So once again, you know, one can say that there's a new liberalization that is happening over here. But I think what's sort of more interesting about that is that there's, there's a place making that is uh, happening, which is transforming landscapes, repurposing them, uh, and the role of the state, the role of private capital is certainly uh, quite uh, significant over here uh, as a dynamic, as indeed it is when we think about these neoliberal imaginaries for the Indus uh, Delta area. There's a longer history, uh, which is something that uh, Majid Motani emphasizes uh, when he talks about coastal transformation. And sort of at this point, I'm, I'm, I'm struck by, by, by how a lot of what someone like Majid Motani, a grassroots activist, was saying, resonated so much with, uh, with, with sort of Rob Nixon's description of slow violence. And, and, and you know, it's almost as if the two could, could, could be uh, in conversation. And of course, a history of dispossession and violence as well. Okay, so I'm going to pause over here, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Karar. And now we move on to uh, Dr. Sunil uh, Amrith um, yeah, of course. on water inequalities and the legacies of colonialism in South Asia. Um, thank you, everybody. It's, it's wonderful to be here at Lanz. Um, and I'm really inspired by everything I've been hearing as a part of the workshop. Um, so I'll just share a few thoughts. Um, picking up on some of the themes that have already come up, I think, in the first two papers. But I'll start with, with Manto's indelible 1951 story, Yazid, in which he tackles the question of water. And the story's opening images is almost shocking. Manto writes, the riots of 1947 came and went in much the same way as spells of bad weather come and go every season. In those first two sentences, Manto evokes, on the one hand, the indifference of nature to human suffering. And he signals the insignificance of human folly faced with the cycle of the seasons. The most memorable exchange in that story takes place uh, between the sage village midwife, Bhakto, and Gina, wife of the protagonist, Karindad. So one day, Bhakto arrives with the news that the Indians are going to close the river. Gina is nonplussed. What, what do you mean by closing the river? And Bhakto replies plainly, they will close the river that waters our crops. Gina laughs in disbelief. You talk like a madwoman. Who can close a river? It's a river, not a drain. And I think in that, is so much that we are still grappling with in relation to dividing water, in relation to sharing water, in relation to distributing water, in relation to governing water. Um, and here we have, in a sense, counterpart projects, the Bakra Dam on the left, um, and uh, um, uh, uh, on the right, uh, much more familiar to Pakistan, the, um, uh, the site uh, of, of, of uh, 
one of the one of the largest stamp projects in Pakistan. Those are completed in 1965. But within a decade, the two big projects are, are on the one hand contending with one another, and on the other hand reflective of the same kind of imaginary, the same kind of developmental uh, imaginary. That in pursuit of a kind of equality in both cases, in pursuit of a developmental project that made promises of distribution, of fairness, of equality, um, we have these monumental technologies that are, of course, engines of multiple forms of inequality, including, as we've heard uh, just now and yesterday in that wonderful documentary film, displacement. And underlying these monumental technologies, of course, is a much more fundamental reversal. And we have this idea that who can close a river? It's a river, not a drain. And yet, stepping back, what we see over the course of the 20th century is an astonishing reversal in the geography of water in South Asia, uh, to the point where, you know, if you think about it, until the 19th century, the only India that Europeans knew or were interested in was the India that was wet, that was rain-fed. And it really is a fundamental reversal that over the course of the 20th century, um, some of the most productive agricultural regions of both India and Pakistan are essentially arid. One could see a similar story in China over the course of the 20th century um, as well. And so what we see, I think, over the course of a century or so is the opposite of the old idea of geography as destiny. Qu quite the opposite. In fact, what we see is an engineering, an engineered redistribution of water in a way that created new futures, but also deep new fractures. I'd like to start by returning to the moment when water inequality came to be seen as a problem. Because we must remember that for most pre-modern societies, the unevenness of rainfall or the seasonality of rivers is not a problem so much as a fact of living. It is to be adapted to with large and small technologies, insured against by collective provisioning, or appeased through ritual and prayer. But in modern times, that comes to be defined as a problem with a solution. And let me point to two very different ways of defining that problem. The first is simply as a technical problem of supply. And this is very famous, and I'll sort of uh, use Arthur Cotton as an example of that 19th century colonial way of thinking. Um, this is a contemporary statue of, of Arthur Cotton that still stands in Rajamundri. Um, Arthur Cotton is very unusual in being a colonial official who is still revered in contemporary India uh, when all streets have been renamed, cities have been renamed, but in fact the Arthur Cotton statue is still a place of reverence because in some sense there's a continuity in seeing that way of thinking about water in the future as, as one that was ultimately beneficial to India. And this is what um, Cotton had to say writing in the 1840s, counteracting the irregularity of natural supplies of water was his aim, so that not an acre at all need be dependent on the rains. This is a problem of supply. By the 1840s, Cotton is already saying, I can imagine we could take the rivers of the Ganga down to South India. So that's one way of defining the problem of water inequality. The other is as a social problem, as a problem of social and political inequality. And to represent that, um, let me point to Dr. Ambedkar's Mahat Satyagraha of March 1927. And what happens here is in the town of Mahat near Pune, local Dalits were denied access to drinking water by upper caste Hindus. And Ambedkar led a 4,000 person strong uh, Satyagraha to drink from the tank. Um, local Dalits faced violent reprisals from upper caste Hindus. Um, Ambedkar persisted. We now want to go to the tank only to prove that like others, we are also human beings, he said. In the end, he called off the protest, trusting in the courts, which at that point did in fact rule that local upper caste Hindus had to open the tank to all. And in some ways, I think if you juxtapose this image with this one, we can see that the post-colonial developmental project really fused these concerns in uneven ways with sometimes uh, perverse and unintended effects. 
<coughs> and the first transformation is, of course, the existential divide that we see, particularly marked in India, I think, between rain-fed and irrigated agriculture. So the benefits of the large dam projects, and I have no wish to deny that there were benefits, were highly unequally distributed, and those who bore the brink a brother brunt of dispossession were, of course, marginalized social and caste groups, Adivasis above all, who struggled to receive adequate compensation and for whom the process of resettlement was deeply traumatic. And then one rigorous estimate of the number of people displaced in India alone by dams between 1947 and 2000 is 40 million people. 40 million people. This is to say nothing of the destruction of the delicate ecosystems, which often reverberated directly on people's lives through changes in disease ecology. I remember that came up in some of the discussion uh, yesterday. And apart from those displaced by these large projects of engineering, um, are those who have never had any benefit from irrigation in the first place. And there's a very powerful piece by Barbara Harris Wright, written more than a decade ago, on what she calls India's rain-fed agricultural dystopia. And uh, the evidence that, that has been there uh, mounting since the 1990s about the effects of um, land consolidation, but also the uh, deepening inequalities between rain-fed and irrigated agriculture in India um, is, 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 is fairly sobering. Going back to Ambedkar's Satyagraha, of course, um, by no means have the deep social discriminations that govern access to water been redressed. Um, a survey, again, done about uh, late 2000s, 2008 or so by Gyan Chams Shah, Amitabh Bhavaskar, and others, uh, found that Dalits regularly face exclusion from water sources in India. 48% of the villages they surveyed uh, report that, 90 years after the Mahat Satyagraha. So the key modernist assumption, of course, is that nature was only unpredictable within certain knowable limits. What climate change has confronted us with, what Amitav Ghosh has described as the great derangement, is that that unpredictability, of course, has multiplied multiple ways. Uh, so regional drivers of changes in monsoon circulation, aerosol emissions, land use change, interact with planetary warming to make the monsoons increasingly erratic and extreme, increasingly extreme. And as ever, I think most attention has been given to solutions that are squarely within that tradition of colonial water engineering. Um, so this is India's controversial uh, interbasin water transfer project, uh, which is far from completion, but which has an estimated cost of around $80 billion explicitly acknowledges Arthur Cotton as the inspiration behind it. Again, rather ironic given the current tone of Indian politics. And the, which the late Ramaswamy Iyer, who's India's water resources minister, decried towards the end of his life as reflecting what he called a Promethean attitude to nature, a sense that nature could simply be reshaped at will. Add to this the state of uh, the spate of dam building in the Himalayas, Right across the region, this is met with resistance, comes with heightened risks of flooding, as well as threats to bio biodiversity and local ecological systems. And most worryingly, the cascade effects of so many projects being concentrated in a single seismically active region. And given the scale of Chinese hydraulic ambitions on the Tibetan plateau, the international tensions over water look set to heighten. And one of the most striking projects that is recently gone quiet in China, but which in the 2010s uh, was the subject of massive investment. And it is widely thought by people who understand that this is still going on, um, is the so-called Tian Shan or Sky River Project, which really imagines the sky as a pipeline and imagines cloud seeding as a way to supplement the north-south transfer of, of water um, to the Yangtze Basin from southern China. This is the justification of the project, a very familiar language. At present, the rate of conversion natural precipitation is very low. If a new interbasin water transfer model is developed through the use of cloud water resources, there's hope to solve the problem. Here we go, the problem of the arid climate. 
It's relatively simple and easy to modify the temporal and spatial distribution of natural precipitation through human intervention into the weather. And so this aerial water transfer can be conducted between the Yellow River Basin and the Yangtze River Basin, forming a new interbasin transfer model, which would supplement the terrestrial pipelines, canals, and other technologies. And I mean, this gives us pause um, in characterizing it as a colonial legacy, which is what it has been in India, and what it might be in Pakistan. Um, in some sense, this reminds us it's a broader modernist legacy. Um, it is a legacy that has been not only embraced, but taken forward by uh, post-colonial regimes, by socialist regimes, uh, and by many others. And so this takes me back to Monto. There's such an irony in that line, who can close a river? It's not a river. It's a river, not a drain. Because at one level, Gina is right. It is at some level absurd to think that we can engineer nature on this scale. And yet that's exactly what states, including the Indian and Pakistani states, have been doing for 50 or 60 years. And these ambitions are completely undimmed. The environmental historian Laura Martin has written recently that, quote, our global biodiversity crisis, a crisis of being, is at its core a crisis of seeing. And so I think a small step towards confronting these long colonial and post-colonial legacies that keep us stuck is to learn to see water in a new way. Monto's story gives us that lens. Anthony's drawings and depictions of the groundwater we do not see gives us a new lens. So do community mapping projects like the collaborative work of environmental activists in Chennai, uh, who work with an architectural <coughs> firm to make this uh, project called City of a Thousand Tanks. In that case, looking at the often vanished infrastructure of tanks that for centuries supplied uh, the settlements there with water. And in marking their absence also brings a sense of their loss, which in a sense had taken place unnoticed and invisible over the course of the 20th century. But I'll leave you um, with an example, not from, from South Asia, but from Southeast Asia, in terms of a different way of, of seeing. Um, this is a work by the Vietnamese artist Tiffany Chung. Um, it's called One Giant Great Flood 2050. And what this work is a response to is maps like these, maps that we've all seen, and I'm quoting from a, a New York Times article, which I see as sort of representative, which is, uh, new projections show high tides subsuming much of Vietnam by 2050, including most of the Mekong Delta, now home to 18 million people, as well as parts of China, Thailand, etc. These are maps of alarm. We see them all the time. They may well be accurate. But what Tiffany Chung is reflecting on is what that means for her home, her home city of Saigon. And so she took maps like this, produced by the Asian Development Bank, and then went back to older maps, went back to early colonial maps, went back to pre-colonial depictions of that landscape um, and produced something which both mobilizes and also in some ways challenges this way of thinking about place and thinking about disaster and thinking about the future. Um, and what she's created is something strangely beautiful. I and mean, she takes that language of those maps of alarm where shading in blue indicates you know, projected inundation in the future. Um, and this is a profoundly archival project, um, but it's also, in a way, uh, a reminder in the way that she describes this work of Saigon's earlier history as a city built on water, as a city that has always responded to water, as a city where uh, modes of habitation are uh, really at that edge, which Anthony mentioned, between land um, and water. So I'll stop there. Thank you.